Welcome to Novelist Spotlight, the podcast where published fiction writers are interviewed to gather their insights and writing lessons so we can use them to make ourselves better and more effective writers. Now, on with our program. Hey, everybody. My name is Jennifer Estep, and I am the best selling author of more than 40 fantasy books. I write urban fantasy, epic fantasy, young adult fantasy, paranormal romance, and I have recently branched out into um, science fiction fantasy. So basically, if there's any kind of fantasy out there that you like to read, I probably have a book or two you might want to check out. In my spare time, I like hanging out with friends and family and doing yoga, and I love all things related to superheroes. I also watch way too much TV, um, as you can probably tell if you follow me on social media. So that's a little bit about me. So no fantasy goes unexplored uh, with Jennifer Estep. Why so much TV? I bet you get a lot of ideas from television. Do you get ideas from from television and streaming uh, series and all that? Uh, I would say yes and no. I mean, you never know what might spark an idea. You know, you see um, a TV show and you wonder, well, what if the character did this thing instead of that thing? And, you know, where would the story go? Or, you know, sometimes I'll we'll see just a story on the news or in the newspaper and be like, huh, that's really interesting. Like, um, I don't even know, like, man steals 20 llamas from farm or something like that. And it's like, why would somebody steal 20 llamas from a farm? You know, so you, you, you never know what might spark an idea. And the reason, one of the reasons that I watch so much TV is, um, you know, as a writer, you have to read your own book so many times. I mean, over and over and over again, you know, for revisions, for copy edits, for page proofs, just for the whole general production process of putting out a book. And A lot of the times at the end of the day, I'm so sick of reading my own stuff that instead of reading a book for fun, I just want to sit on the couch and veg out and watch a TV show. I get it. I get it. So talk about fantasy a little bit. What kind? There's a lot of different styles of fantasy. I mean, just to give our (laughs) listeners an idea, uh, some of your book titles are Galactic Bonds, Section 47, Elemental Assassin, Crown of Shards, Gargoyle Queen. Uh, Mythos Academy, uh, Black Blade. Uh, so what what types of fantasy? I mean, when I look at something like Section 47, I think of uh, I think of Area 51 and I think of aliens and spacecraft, uh, galactic bonds, uh, maybe uh, relationships between um, civilizations around the uh, the cosmos. Well, wh- what do you say? Um. I think it's interesting how you would hear something like Section 47 and think that it's a sci-fi book. It's actually an urban fantasy series about spies with magic. And Section 47 is the name of the, um, you know, secret government organization that they all work for. Ah, Yeah. Whereas Galactic Bonds is a space opera. It's kind of like um, Star Wars meets Bridgerton in space. So it's it's really interesting, you know, like I come up with a series title like that and then people they hear it and they have their own interpretation of what it might mean. And sometimes they're right. And sometimes they're wrong. How did you get started in this? I mean, were you, were you a person who knew you loved to write and think of stories from a very young age or did you just come along during your college years? How did it all begin? I actually always loved to read. Every Saturday, my mom would take me to our little local library and I would get a whole stack of books to read for the week. And, you know, the next week we would go back and I would get new books and just over and over and over again. I mean, I think we went to the library probably just about every single Saturday when I was a kid um, for a long, long time. And, you know, as you get older and you go through school and you have to write essays and you have to start thinking more critically about the things that you're reading um, for school assignments and different projects and things like that. And somewhere along the way, I thought I could write a book that's better than the one that I was currently reading. Um, so I said, good down- feeling when you reach that stage, isn't it? Where you <laughs> actually can have that thought. I, I know what you're talking about though, because for the longest time I thought, well, I, I'm never going to be good enough to write books. I'm going to be a newspaper reporter. But you reach a point where it's kind of like, you know, I could do that. So it happened to you. It's a great feeling. 
It is. One summer during college, I thought I'm going to sit down and see if I can actually write a book. And I did. And it was a very, very bad epic fantasy book that will never see the light of day. Um, but I had been, you know, bitten by the writing bug. So I wrote another book and another book and another book. And um, eventually I wrote seven books over the course of about seven years. And I finally um, got an agent for my seventh book. It's called Karma Girl. It's the first book in my big time superhero series. And that's the one that sold to a publisher. And that was my first published book back in 2007. And it's interesting that you had mentioned being a newspaper reporter because that was actually my day job. I studied journalism in college and I have a master's degree in professional communications. And I worked at a daily newspaper for about 10 years. And that was actually really helpful um, in my publishing career because, you know, as a reporter, sometimes you'll have 15 minutes to write a story on deadline. So working at the newspaper definitely taught me how to write quickly. Um, and it also taught me a lot about editing because I would also, you know, edit feature stories and press releases and things like that too. Interesting. So you learned how to be productive. You learned how to write quickly. You have got 40 novels out there. Is that the number that you said, 40 of them? Uh, or, more or than 40. 40. I want to say, 40. I want to say about 45. I would actually have to go back and count because I, I tend to lose count after a while. I'm just, I'm focused on what I'm writing right now and not thinking about anything else. So uh, that being the case, you're highly productive, Jennifer. So I'm curious, what do you do that makes you so productive? Because that's a lot of books. You're a young woman um, and 40 books is a lot. So talk about what kind of regimen you uh, or discipline that you maintain to be that productive. Writing is my full-time job and, you know, I treat it like a regular day job. You know, I get up every morning about eight o'clock and eat breakfast while I'm at the computer, checking my email, looking at my social media, just doing kind of all my little administrative tasks that I need to do to get started. And then about nine o'clock, I will kind of turn off the email and social media and sit down and work on whatever I need to work on for that day, whether it's writing a rough draft or revising a draft, I'm reading through copy edits, looking at page proofs, um, just whatever kind of writerly thing that I need to do. And, you know, I work, I work till lunch and take a break. I work a couple more hours in the afternoon and take a little bit of a longer break. Sometimes if I'm on deadline, I might work from like seven to nine or seven to 10 at night. Um, and then I get up and do it all again the next day. You get a lot of hours in, it sounds like. So how many how many words? Let me ask you this. Uh, you were about to say something, though, Jennifer. Go ahead and say that. When, after I said you get a lot of hours and I heard you, an intake of breath like you were about to comment. <laughs> you know, I do get a lot of hours in, but I do kind of space it out and break it up during the day. Um, because, you know, being a writer comes with its own kind of physical challenges, all the computer time, all the sittings, not good for your neck and your shoulders and your body. So I, I do try to break it up a little bit. And I better keep your energy level higher, too, because you, you get up and you do other things. You're moving around and getting other things done. Definitely. So your mom would go to the library with you. Uh, let's go back in time a little bit. These were formative years for you. What is the most influential book you've read? I don't know that there's one book that was more inf influential than any other book. I would say there are probably a couple of books that have really influenced me, Um one of those I would say would be the book Beauty by Robin McKinley. It's just a really lovely retelling of the Beauty and the Beast fairy tale. Um, and, you know, that was kind of one of the books that sparked my interest, more of a deeper interest in fantasy and fantasy books and things like that. Another book series that I really like is the James Bond series by Ian Fleming. Mm. I think, yeah, I read those, I want to say, when I was in high school. and he in the in the James Bond series, he's just developed such a perfect formula for an action adventure book because you have the great character in Bond. You have the exotic locales and the gadgets and, and all these things that you think of when you think of a James Bond book. And I think it's just it's a great formula for a story. What is the biggest writing lesson you've learned? Oh, gosh, I would say that I learned something new with each book, whether it's 
something about language or editing or the best way to tell a story. I would say kind of the biggest writing lesson that I've had to discover for myself is just to keep going and not give up because like I said before, it took me seven books in about seven years before I got an agent and got published. Publishing is, is a very tough business to be in, whether you're a traditional publisher or, or an indie publisher, you know, there is a lot of rejection and, you know, even if your book gets published, you're still going to get a lot of negative reviews for it. So you just kind of have to have that inner determination to keep going no matter what. What about your agent? Your agent saw your manuscript and contacted you. What was it about the manuscript? What did he or she say? And what did your agent say they saw your audience as? So back in the mid 2000s was when I got started in traditional publishing. And back then, one of the very popular genres was paranormal romance. And like I said, Karma Girl was the first book that I got published. And it's basically a superhero paranormal romance. So I was what they call a slush pile baby. And um, a slush <laughs> pile is based. Well, no, that's what they call it. Uh, basically, you know, agents get so many unsolicited submissions that, you know, they call them a slush pile. Um, and yeah, she, um, my agent back then, uh, she, I had submitted the manuscript to her and she read it and then she contacted me and, you know, we kind of went from there and I, it's been so long, you know, I don't remember exactly what she said. I think she probably thought it was just a fun take on superheroes because it's very, Karma Girl is kind of very campy and tongue in cheek and over the top. So, yeah, I, I think she just thought it was a fun book. Tell me about your audience. So if you were to, to characterize <clears throat> readership, because you must have communication with your readership, uh, what would you say are your readers who out there, if they were listening right now, somebody who's not familiar with Jennifer Eastep, uh, what would you say uh, is uh, kind of characterize your style? You're going to love my book <clears throat> if pose it that way. You are going to love my books if you like strong heroines, first person point of view, lots of action, adventure, danger, magic, and romance, and lots of food talk. Food talk. Tell me more about food talk. We all like to eat. <laughs> uh, my Elemental Assassin series, um, my main character is Jen Blanco, and she's an assassin, and she runs a barbecue restaurant. So I have a lot of scenes in those books about, you know, her cooking food for her friends and family, her cooking at the restaurant. And I just have a lot of fun coming up with all the uh, the barbecue and the other things that, that Jen makes in the books. Who's your favorite character? Do you have a character you created that is uh, uh, your favorite uh, do you have a, a an ensemble that you reprise or is everything going to be new every time? Well, you do have a series, though, you said there, there are certain series you have. So you probably do have uh, abiding characters. You know, all my different series have their own kind of cast of characters. Found family is another big theme in my books. So like in my Elemental Assassin series, you know, you have Jim Blanco, the assassin. She's the main character. And then um, she has a sister and then she has some people who work at the restaurant with her. She has old family friends. So I, I do have, um, you know, a different cast of characters in, in every book. And it's always interesting to me to see who the most popular characters are from series to series. Um, a lot of people tend to like the secondary characters, I think, sometimes more than the, the main characters. Let me ask you to give a yes or no to, to these questions. In your books, uh, there is uh, violence. Yes. How about sex? Sometimes. How about family? Yes. Conflict, almost with it, almost inevitably, right? You can't write a book without conflict, right? So there's a lot of conflict, would you say? Definitely. That reminds me um, of something one of my journalism professors said. Uh, he said, oh, what was it that he said exactly? only trouble is interesting to read about how about dysfunctional relationships sometimes yeah dysfunctional relationships are much more interesting than normal quote-unquote normal relationships to me because it's kind of like when they're normal it's just you know it's quotidian it's one thing to another to another and every and a good time was had by all but uh uh with dysfunctional relationships you got 
you have a lot more interesting interactions. A lot of times with dysfunction, they're certainly uh, more colorful um, and can be in, insightful. Um, what, what am I leaving out here? What else should I be bringing? Oh, uh, space travel. Sometimes. <laughs> Depends on which series you read. <laughs> Out-of-body experiences. Not really. I, I don't do... I wouldn't say I do a lot of that. I do a lot of um, dreams and flashbacks. Spirituality? Mm, not so much. Well, you have to do wor wor world building if you're a fantasy writer, correct? So yes. So talk to us about world building. Um, first of all, let's not assume, because a lot of people are not uh, fantasy or even science fiction readers. Talk about what world building is and then talk about your uh, methodology for for uh, bringing a world into into uh, to, uh, to fruition. So, in a lot of fantasy and sci-fi writing, you know, we use the term world building, and really, what that kind of means is the world in which the book is set. And basically, you're talking about if it's a fantasy book, what kind of magic or powers do your characters have? What kind of magical creatures might be in the book? You know, is it set in our modern day world or some version of that? Is it set in a dystopian landscape? Is it on an alien planet? What have you? The world building is just kind of all the elements that go into your fantasy book. Say if the United States was a world, um, then you would think about is your book set in California? Is it set in Texas? Is it set in New York or, or wherever? And then, you know, you just, you populate it with the kind of magical powers and creatures that inspire you or that you're interested in writing about. Urban fantasy is usually set in, you know, modern contemporary world. Like my Elemental Assassin series is set in, you know, the Southern U.S., but then I have a series like the Galactic Bond series that's set in a made up galaxy called the um, Archipelago Galaxy with different planets and moons and things like that. So it, it just depends on the series as to what the world is like. Now, you said you're a newspaper reporter. Did you enjoy reporting or did you find that because you have a writer's imagination, a, a fiction writer's imagination, that uh, it got frustrating at times because it was all facts and figures that you were dealing with? I enjoyed talking to people. So I mostly worked in the features department. So I got to interview a lot of authors and artists and, you know, people doing community projects and things like that. And to me, that was really interesting to, you know, meet people and see what their hobbies were and, you know, just talk to them about what they were passionate about. But it was also kind of frustrating because I knew that I would rather be writing books than working at the newspaper and, you know, telling the stories that I wanted to tell. So it was lucky number seven, Karma Girl, that a, an agent said, hey, this thing needs to be, I want to take this to the you know, publishing company. I'm going to sell the editors on this and we're going to get this thing published. So lucky number seven, but the first six, did they just sit in a drawer or did you self-publish those? No, they are still sitting in a drawer. And that, like I said, they will probably never see the light of day. Although I have gone back and taken, you know, bits and pieces from those old books and, you know, put them in some of my, some of my published books. Now, uh, do they, why, why do, do you say they'll never see the light of day? Do you not see an opportunity to resuscitate them with the increased skill level you've got now? I think they would just require so much editing and revising that my time would be better spent working on something new from scratch. And a couple of them were in genres, like I wrote a cozy murder mystery. Um, so, you know, that's not really a genre that I want to write in today. So, yeah, I think, I think my time would be better served just starting from scratch and starting from where I am as a writer today, rather than trying to go back and, you know, fix all the problems in those early books. I understand. Now, you have written 40, you, your first seven years, I think you said you wrote a book a year. Are you still, are you still producing a book a year? I usually write two or three books a year. Two or three. Okay. So you're going to be a hundred plus books by time, by time you're done with your writing career. 
Ah, we'll see, but knock on wood. <laughs> yeah, knock on wood always. You know, we never know what's, <clears throat> what's going to, what life will throw in our way. But you, you're on a feverish pace. Now, do you, let me think, how do I ask this question? You can produce books at that kind of a rate. But on the other hand, do you ever step back and say, you know, I'd like to produce just one book in 18 months because I feel like I can take it to a higher level? Like with most of the people I interview, Jennifer, I haven't had a chance to read your books, which is why I'm digging into this. And 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 that works for our listeners, I think, because so many of them probably have not. I mean, most, most, most authors don't have the majority of the readers out there. So um I'm trying to to dig in a little bit here. Are, are your books primarily plot or do you try to do stuff that's beyond plot? Are you looking to do um, uh, have literary flourishes in there or is it really all about the story? To me, it's it's all about the story and the characters and where that they take me. You know, I think every writer puts literary flourishes in their books because that's what makes a book, a Jennifer Eastep book and not a book by another author is how I write that story. I would really, I would love to cut back, you know, and write maybe one book a year, but you yeah, know, their contract. Um, sometimes contracts come into consideration. You know, you have to deliver the books to the publisher by a certain time. And then if you indie publish, like I do too, you know, you want to get books out at a certain time of the year, but yeah, I would, I would like to cut back and just write one book a year just so I can take some time off, you know, and do more things for fun and not be a total workaholic like I have been for the last several years. Which of your novels, if you can even say, is there one that you feel like you really kind of hit your peak uh, or one that you were at the height of your powers and is the one that if, if you were just going to hand one off to somebody and say, this is Jennifer E. Steps writing. Uh, is the one you would you would hand off. I really like Only Bad Options. Um, that's my latest book. It came out in September of this year. It's book one in my Galactic Bonds science fiction fantasy series. And the reason that I say that one is that one was very much a book of my heart. So I'm known for writing fantasy books and writing science fiction, you know, was a little bit of a departure for me. But I had this idea and I just really, really wanted to write it. Uh, and I had a little break in my writing schedule and I thought I'm going to sit down and see if I can write a sci-fi book because I thought it would be fun to write kind of a different kind of world with spaceships and planets and things like that. And um, I think it turned out really well. So, yeah, that one right now is my favorite. Um, I always kind of joke and say that my favorite book is the one that I just finished because it's done and I don't have to think about it anymore. But, yeah, I, I really like Only Bad Options. So that Only that's my options. favorite okay. right now. So I was going to say you're getting stronger as you go, but you say that whichever one you finish is kind of your, your favorite. So there's a sense of relief there and accomplishment, I'm sure. Definitely. Uh, yeah. So... Is, is is only bad options at hand? Do you can you extend your arm and grab a copy of it? Could you read us an excerpt? Um, hold on one second. Let me see. Okay, so this is like the opening line and the opening couple of paragraphs. Oh, so lay is... it on us. <laughs> Why don't you so do this... uh, more than a couple of paragraphs? Could you do like a, a couple pages? Uh, no, I actually don't like to read to people. Okay, do, do whatever you're comfortable with. Okay. Sometimes in life, you have only bad options, like planning to commit corporate espionage in the morning, becoming a whistleblower by noon, and trying not to be murdered by midnight. So that's kind of the opening kind of hook of the book. Mm -hmm. The thing that I hope will get people to say, you know, who is this person? What are these bad options? You know, what kind of trouble is she in? That sort of thing. Definitely a hook there. Why don't you like reading to people? Um, it's just a thing that I don't like to do. I would rather be talking to people or answering questions about writing than, you know, sitting and reading to someone. Right, right. Now, do you have some audio books out? I forgot to check Audible. Yes, almost all of my books are available on Audible as audiobooks. I take it you're not the reader. 
Oh, no, that is a performance voice skill that I do not have. <laughs> <laughs> it's always good to have a professional reader. That's a, that's a great thing. There's a lot of writing quotations out there, Jennifer, that I'm sure you're familiar with. Is there a writing quotation that um, one you hold close to your heart, maybe one that's even serves as an incantation for you? It's not actually from a book, but one of the quotes that I really like is, never give up, never surrender. And it's from the movie Galaxy Quest. Uh, and I think that's, well, first of all, that's a really fun movie if you've never seen it. And second of all, I think that's just such a good motto for any writer or any kind of artist to have, because like I said before, writing and publishing, there's a, a lot of rejection in the publishing world. And, you know, for any kind of artistic endeavor, whether it's painting or sculpture or music or, or whatever you're doing, and I just, like I said, I think you have to love what you do and just have that inner determination to keep going no matter what. Now, never give up. However, you're talking about on the writing, um, you know, the writing game or writing process in general, but you would not say, I don't think, never give up on a book you're working on because you might be working on something that you realize this just doesn't have the lift I'm looking for. I've or or I, I know that in my own case, I wrote myself into a corner the first two times I, I was trying to write a novel and kind of trapped myself and I just chucked them. I didn't chuck writing, but I chucked those efforts. Would you agree yeah. that it's a good idea to give up on a book if, if it's not working and move on to something that's going to be more fruitful? Definitely. I think if you're really struggling with something and, you know, you have that inner voice saying that maybe this isn't the genre for me or maybe this story isn't quite right or whatever, then, yeah, you know, take a step back from it. Let it sit for a couple of days and think about, you know, am I still excited to go back to this and start writing again? Or do I have a different idea that I think that might work out better? Um, I think a lot of it is about trusting your instincts and realizing that, it, it is okay to put something aside if it's not working for you. What about a perfect writing day? What's your idea of a perfect writing day? And, by, and maybe perfect is in the word, uh, a particularly satisfying writing day. What makes a writing day really satisfying or perfect for you? I would say when I get to write a scene and it just works, the characters, um, the story, it all just kind of clicks together for me. And I feel like I'm making good forward progress on both the plot and the characters, emotional arcs. Um, to me, that that's a really good writing day. When you write something that brings a smile to your face, or you think, you know, that's a really great bit of banter between my characters or that's a really cool fight scene or I really like the way that I describe this magical creature um I think you have to take the joy in the little things like that because you know writing it is a lot of you staring at your computer screen and it can really be a slog to write to write a book from start to finish and then to go back and do all the the other revision and production work so yeah I think it's important to to find the joy in what you're writing. Now, the great Graham Greene used to write X number of words a day. He would do that every day because, um, because that's what worked <laughs> for him. Do you have a productivity, just a word count metric or, or goal that you shoot for, or is the volume of words not really what it's about for you? It depends what stage in the process that I'm in. So for my first draft, I do what some people call a vomit draft. Um, <laughs> and by that, I mean, I just sit down and I write and I write about five or 6,000 words a day. And I write straight through from start to finish till the first draft is done. Uh, and these are not good words or final words by any stretch of the imagination. It's just about me getting the story and the characters down. And I believe it's Nora Roberts that has the famous quote that says, uh, you can't fix a blank page. So, yeah, for me, um, I, I will keep an I eye on that. the, yeah. You I, can't I, fix a blank page. That's Nora I, Roberts who said that, huh? I, I believe it's Nora Roberts. And I, I don't know if I have the wording quite right, but I, I believe that's. But we get the, the spirits there. Yeah. So I, I do have a word count with the first draft, but after that, it's more about, um, you know, I might try to shoot for, I revised 
10 or 20 pages today, or, you know, if the book is further along and I'm reading through the copy edits, maybe, you know, maybe I read 50 pages today. So it really just depends what stage in the production process that I'm in. So tell us something people would be surprised to know about Jennifer Eastep. Well, you know, that's kind of the thing. I feel like with social media, you know, authors talk about so many of our interests online that maybe there aren't a lot of surprises anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Yeah, a lot of people spill. Uh, but I will say, because it's October, you know, I love the fall season. It's one of my favorites with the pumpkins and the fall leaves and the cooler weather. And I also, I'm a really big football fan and I am obsessed with my fantasy football leagues right now. Are you good at them? Uh, Is this leagues. NFL? You're talking about the NFL fantasy football league? Yeah. NFL Who's, fantasy football. Who'd you draft as your quarterback? Uh, I have Josh Allen in one of oh. my leagues. Yeah. Wow. So I'm doing pretty good in that league. <laughs> yeah. So if you're having a dinner party and you can invite any three literary figures, living or dead, who do you invite to this dinner party? Which three people, literary figures? Do you mean authors or characters? Oh, you, uh, interesting. Uh, you, uh, you answer that for us, either one or both. Okay, I will do authors, um, and I will say Ian Fleming, because like I said before, I'm a really big James Bond fan. I will also say Robin McKinley, because again, I really love her book, um, Beauty. Gosh, for the third one, I don't know. There's so many authors that I really like. I guess I would say Donald Westlake. He wrote the Dortmunder series, which is this it's basically this series of comic crime capers that are about these thieves that have the worst luck ever. And they're just so funny and kind of um, the humor is really, is really fun in them. So yeah, those are probably be my three picks right now, but I mean, I could probably invite a hundred authors to dinner. Jennifer, thank you very much for taking the time. Our guest has been Jennifer Eastep and I appreciate you taking the time and, and uh, sharing your writing insights with us. Well, thanks for taking the time to interview me. I appreciate it.